Matthew, the fourth chapter, verse number one through verse number three. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. There, there really is a devil. There really is a devil. I don't think the world even thinks anything about that, but there really is a devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was after, afterward a hunger, talking about Jesus. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Notice verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, and the tempter said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread bread. For a little bit today, I want to talk to you about the real target. Turn to somebody and say, there is a real target. Then you can be seated. In this place, there is a real target. What I want to be dealing with today is this. I think many times that we get off and we think the devil is after certain things and we miss the fact that he's got a real target. Different than we are where we're all the time shooting out in every direction hoping that we hit something, the devil is very strategic about the things that he does. Uh, I know we use the term, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but when the man that could not speak uh, was healed by the Lord, the Lord said, that dumb devil. And I think sometimes that he is the dumb devil. But that does not mean, of course, I know he was talking about speech. But I do believe that when the, you talk about what the enemy does, he's been at it a long time. And he's had quite success with it. Been very successful with it. So if we can hone in on the target in which he is shooting for, I think it would change the way we approach our walking with God. I want to talk to you about temptation first. This is the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this may seem to be a boring subject to you. Well, Jesus was tempted and, uh, you know, he was tempted to eat. He was tempted to fall down and worship uh, Satan. He was tempted when he was placed in the pinnacle of the temple and was asked to throw himself down to show that, you know, he would be protected and all of those things. And, and so what is there in here for me? Because if you only see the temptation of the Lord as just about him, then you've missed the whole subject. It was supposed to be about what we would encounter and how we would handle temptation. Now, Jesus was tempted at all points like we are yet without sin. When it says all points, we think of it as like, there's no way he was tempted with, with the things I'm tempted with, because I'm a woman, he's a man, there's no way that we can have the same temptation. It's not talking about every temptation or every little thing you can name. It's talking about the three points, every point that we encounter. Let me tell you what those are. Those are the lust of the eye, that's the pride of life, and that is the lust of the flesh. Now let me clarify this so you'll get this, and you, you, you won't miss this part. Everything we're tempted with falls under those three categories. It, it's obvious that what people were facing in the Bible, we are tempted with things they were not tempted with because they did not exist. Like watching the right things. They didn't have to worry about that. They didn't, they didn't have that to deal with. But, but you do have that to deal with. So that becomes a place of the lust of the eye. Or the lust of the flesh. You can fall in any one of those categories. The lust of the eye is still going on today, which means that people look and they want something that they don't need. The lust of the eye reaches out. It's all the time seeing things. This is one of the reasons why people live their life in debt is because they're always wanting something else. I, I, I've had young couples in our church that on the weekends they just go out and, and look at cars. That's a dangerous thing to do. I, I stopped that. I haven't looked at, uh, driven around and looked at cars in many, many years. And the other day when we paid our car off, I'm going to tell you, when I pull up beside somebody, they can be in a Ferrari, Maserati, uh, they can be in a Bentley or a Rolls Royce, and I don't care what it looks like, the one I'm driving looks the best. 
a, a clean coupon book drives so well. You can't believe how good it feels to be in that. And just be, the other day, our battery died on us. The devil was after us all day, bless his holy name. We got out of the store uh, or got out of the restaurant. Canaan was with us. Brandon was with us. Sister Macy. It just clicked. And I mean, we're sitting there. We've got a place we've got to be in 45 minutes. And we're at a restaurant. And that thing is just clicking along. And what you tempted to do at that moment is this is why, this is what happens when you pay it off. Your battery goes dead. I might as well go get something else. A battery is cheaper than another car. By the way, it was under warranty. It didn't cost me anything. But what happens is we get to seeing something that we don't really need to see. The pride of life is how people view us and, and what we have in our life. And it's the pride of life. Jesus was tempted in that. And all these things fall in this. Envy and, and murder and deceit. All these things fall in these categories. The lust of the flesh. This is the thing that was tempting Adam and Eve. This is the thing that tempted the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the things that tempt you. You say, well, I'm not tempted to sexual immorality. There are other lusts in the flesh. Sometimes it's just entertaining yourself to death. Sometimes it's just having more things and you're never satisfied with anything. It just The flesh just continues to want more. That's what fasting tries to bring under subjection is you telling the flesh what to do, not the flesh telling you what to do. But let me just show you something. Just because you're tempted does not mean you have sinned. And, and, and this is a hard thing for people to deal with. The Bible said Jesus was tempted at all points as we are yet without sin. But let me tell you what the devil will do to you. He, if he can't get you to sin, he will beat you to death over the fact that you thought about sinning or that you were tempted to sin. Because here's what happens, and you know it's true, and this is why it's quiet, because it's so true, that you can't hardly raise your hands after you've been tempted. You didn't do it, but the fact that you were tempted, what kind of Christian are you? Well, the same kind of Christian Jesus was, evidently, because he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. You know, there was a guy in our church some years back that uh, he had a leadership place in our church, and uh, he, he had a business, and he was going through some things with his business, and, and it was late one night, and he was just driving around, and, and he was just so upset, and he stopped at a store, and he just thought, I'm just going to get a six-pack of beer. And, and, and I just, I'm going to drown my troubles. Now, that ought to really fix up your problems. If you, if, you, if you got a bunch of problems, drink more. That way you won't have as many problems. He said, I went back. Now, he was crying when he was telling this. He said, I went back to the store, and he said, I opened up the, 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 the refrigerator part of it, and I couldn't get it open. I realized it was chained up. And I couldn't buy any beer. And I said, I went back to my car and I sat there and cried and told the Lord how sorry I was. And he said, do I need to give up my position? And I just said, did you do it? He said, no. And he said, but I was so, I was going to. And had it not been for the, the law, you know, back then, you, you know, they quit serving. You couldn't buy beer at a certain time. As a matter of fact, y'all probably don't know this. There was a time you couldn't buy alcohol on Sunday. And there were stores that didn't open up on Sundays because of the blue law. You could, they didn't even sell stuff on Sundays. Oh, God, I wish those days still existed. That'd be bad on a lot of them. Right now, we're already upset that, that, uh, uh, that uh, Chick-fil-A is not open on Sunday. Some of you go get out and you say, hey, why don't we just eat Chick-fil-A? It's Sunday, honey. Oh, my Lord, why, the, why are they trying to abide by something? Good Lord. Don't they know that we're hungry on Sunday? And Pentecostal people are extremely hungry on Sunday. But here, here's what I want you to see. I kept on talking to him until I said, listen to me. You didn't do it. Well, I wanted to. That's what temptation is. If on the way to do something wrong, you have a flat tire and you go back and it changes your mind, thanks be unto God. But don't live under condemnation because you're tested or tempted over something because Jesus was tempted. Just because you're tempted doesn't mean you sin. I can't get that through people's head. I want this to go into your coconut today. I want this to get down to where you are today. Well, I'd, if, if I had had the flat, 
I'd have done something wrong. If those doors would have been, wouldn't have been chained up, I'd have had a six pack of beer. Don't tell them where my life would be. I said, what it would have been is you would have felt bad and you would have repented and then I would have talked to you and we'd have made sure you go on with God because this is stumbling and falling. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets up again. But I want to tell you something around church and especially around Pentecostal church, if you fall seven times, you might have to move to the back row because we not only have a clock that clocks in when people pray through it and they, they receive the Holy Ghost, get baptized in Jesus' name, we pull out that clock and we click it to see how long it's going to be before they line it up. And brother, if it don't fall in that clock, evidently they didn't get the Holy Ghost. And another thing is, if we see people stumbling, coming down the altar and praying, and they stumble and they come back and they pray through again, they stumble, and we're already checking those boxes. And there's this, listen, this coupon's fixing to be torn out. Well, there's only so many of them. And when we stop and think about the innumerable mercies of the Lord that are renewed every day, that God has given us tens of thousands of opportunities to make it, who are we to judge somebody that fails? That's just me. That's just my thinking. So the enemy could not get him to sin, but he tempted him to sin. I say it like this all the time. I have people tell me this all the time. They say, well, these thoughts in my head, I, I, I just keep thinking these things. You know, and, and it doesn't all have to be an immoral thing. It can be things like, uh, I, I've been thinking about taking that stuff off the job that don't belong to me. You know, I've been thinking about doing this. I've been thinking about doing this, but, but I haven't let myself do it. And I just feel terrible that as a Christian, I would let that go on. And I, I, I've told people this a lot of times when it comes to thoughts. I said, listen, you can't stop the birds flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. You can't stop these thoughts that come to you. As a matter of fact, while I was talking about them, you thought some of them. Yeah, those are the ones, Pastor. Oh, God, give me, give me grace. I wish we could erase some of that, but the problem is your brain just keeps on recalling all of these things, all your failures, all the things you've done, everything that's wrong, everything you've been tempted in. But I want you to understand something and, and never forget this, that the temptation was not just these three areas. There was a definite target that was in these temptations. There was something that Satan was after. And this is what I want you to see in verse number three. If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. The true target of the temptation is who he is and his identity. If you be the son of God, fall down and worship me and I'll give you all the kingdom. If, if you be the son of God, take yourself to the high place of the temple and throw yourself down and he will give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against the stone. That's what it says in the Psalms. Or make these stones into bread if you're the son of God. Every one of the temptations cut to the heart of his identity. I'm going to say this to you carefully so you'll understand this. The, de the devil would never say you're not a child of God. But the devil will insert, if you are a child of God, why are you in this situation? Why are you thinking this way? Why are you tempted in this direction? Why are you having to pray back through? Why are you walking in discouragement if you are a child of God? But that's what he used with Jesus. So how can we be exempt if our own Savior was not exempt? The devil placed the if on the holiest spot that it could ever be placed, and that is the Word of God. Back in, in the book of Matthew, when Jesus was baptized, the Bible said the Spirit descended on him, and this was the voice that came out of heaven saying, the Spirit, the invisible Spirit of God, said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. That should have sealed it. That should have settled it. That should have been the end of it all. But Satan comes because he's got a target that he's after. And this is what he, he knows what God said. But what he does is he comes back and says, if you are, make these stones into bread. Let me question your identity. Let me 
question your qualification to even be who you are. If you're the son of God, then make these stones into bread. Cast yourself down or fall down and worship me. Listen, the devil's not going to tell you you're a sinner because you know you're living above that. But what he's going to tell you, if you are a child of God, then why are you going through the things you're going through? Why is it that you're dealing with the things that you're dealing with if you are the Son of God? It's unbelievable that people have been lost through the years over a two-letter word, I-F. If you have it. If it's going to happen. If this is going to be the way God wants it to be. And I am here to tell you that is the target that the devil has on everybody's back. The identity of who you are and what God has called you to be and what God's made you out to be. The devil is battling us with those very words. This is a plain truth that came from God Almighty. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. See, there are times that this if is placed on past divine manifestation. Like in Matthew 3, 16, when Jesus was baptized. At that moment, the enemy's gonna look back to Matthew, the third chapter, verse number 16. He's gonna look back to John the Baptist baptizing him, and he's gonna try to inject in him if you are, well, God said he was. That should settle it. But if you go back to the Garden of Eden, it was this little bit of doubt that caused Adam and Eve to give up their place. Hath not God said? That's what the enemy had. That's the only tool that he had. They had it made if they would have just said, God did say this and we're sticking by what he said, that would have been all right. But the enemy couldn't say God didn't say it. But he just had to put the if in there. If this is true, then let it be. So sometimes you look back on past manifestations when you're in your moment and the enemy and you start reflecting back on what God's done in your life and what God has, has brought you through and, and the prayers that the Lord answered, you start looking back on those times and instead of that being the thing that launches you into victory, the enemy looks back on that and scrawls IF on there. It's now it's an if. Listen, every one of you here know what it is to go back a few years in your life or months or weeks, whatever it is, and be able to say, I know that was the Lord. I know God did that. I know God said that and God accomplished that. Sometimes we move on to the next need so quickly we don't even stop to think about what he's ever done. We don't have time to even praise the Lord. Do you remember when the lepers, uh, he said, go show yourself to the priest and as they went, they were cleansed and nine of them went on and one of them came back and praised the Lord and the Lord said, you're gonna be made whole. Where are the nine? Well, I don't know. They got what they needed, they're gone. Many times we operate just like that. We get what we need and we just go on until we need him the next time. Instead of stopping to say, this, there's something to this. Let me just tell you, we found a little note the other day. Uh, we were going through some of our stuff. I was telling them this this morning. After Harvey, we put a bunch of stuff in our, in our garage and we hadn't even gone through it. I, we didn't even know what all, all was out there. And, and uh, so we started going through it yesterday and, and the task, my goodness, we had, we had cards that people had written us. We came across a card that my dad had written us when we lived on Old Spring, 234 Old Spring Lane. Uh, he wrote us a card, and, and he was thanking us. Uh, I had bought him a bed liner for his truck, and he was, he was thanking us for the bed liner in his truck. And he was saying, uh, he said, I know the Lord's going to bless our church. And he said, I do believe that God's going to give us the money to get the things done that we needed to get. Now, this has been years ago. And when we were reading that, I said, that has been fulfilled. That is what he said was going to happen. And God has come through, given us the money to build, given us the money to pay our debt, given us money to have the things that we needed to give to missions and to do all the things that we needed to do. I kept that card because I thought I'm never going to forget. The enemy's not going to look back there and say, hey, listen, that probably would have happened anyway. No, sir. You're not going to put an if on what God said it's going to be. I'm not going to let that happen. If God's ever healed you, don't let the enemy tell you it probably would have happened anyway. 
If you had God come through on your finances, don't let the enemy tell you, well, the company was going to give you something anyway. Or, or that check was coming in the mail. It was going to happen no matter what you did. That's how he will steal away your victory because the identity to all of this, that's what he's after. That's the real target is that as children of God, God does things for you. Amen. He is our heavenly father. I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, we were talking about Canaan was with us the other night. It was Uncle Brandon and Sister Macy and me and, and Canaan. And uh, our kids, Brittany and Brandon, can't get used to the fact that the grandchildren get by with stuff that they didn't get by with. But the reason they weren't our grandchildren, I hope y'all can understand that. Our, our grandchildren are, are precious and wonderful. If we'd have known how wonderful they are, we'd have had them at the first. But we had to have the children first. And, and so they'll be like, well, they get by with this. And, you know, they'll say, we never could pull the, couch, the cushions off the couch. You know, we never could do all these things. And, and, and so they're, they're, there's three of them right there. And so they know what all this is. Now, I'm not telling them telling them anything that they don't know anything about. When they get to the happy house, that's exactly what it is. Torin claims it's a place where the word no is not known. And Sister Macy told him it is known, it's just not used. But we were talking about all of this stuff that had happened in our lives and things that God had done and how that the Lord treats us like a son. He treats us like one of his. And so the Lord, because you have battled an illness, that's not God getting on to you or condemning you for something that happened to you in 1964. Sometimes we reach way back and try to find a reason. My battery died the other day, and you know what? It wasn't anything to do with God or the devil. At the time, I wanted to say, you devil. But I just, we just got an Uber, they came and picked us up, and then I had to come back and jump the thing off and take it to the place. The battery was uh, under warranty. They gave me another battery, and it's done. But at the time, you could have something happen to you, and the first thing you want to think of, because the enemy makes sure of this, that you liken this to something God's doing to you. He's treating you bad for some reason. And I'm saying if that's the Heavenly Father, when, every, when my kids got out of line and when they acted up I never one time ever said I hope they get the flu I never one time said I hope they get cancer I, I hope they have a car wreck and get all beat up and have to be in the hospital for a long time so they can be punished I never thought about that never entered my mind but we think of those kinds of things when anything happens to us and we can remember something we've done in the last 10 years that was wrong. We just kind of think, well, this is God finally catching up to me and finally going to put his head on my neck and finally going to make sure that I'm punished for the things I've done. You've got to understand that the target is really not about these temptations. The target is that he wants you to not believe that you're a child of God. Because children of God have certain privileges. And that's what I'm going to end with today. It's the question of identity. 30 years Jesus lived and there was never one moment that we read that enemy comes and says, what if? Some of you live faithfully for God for so long. And the minute something happens, something disastrous or something, some kind of crisis, first thing that pops in your head, what if? This is the end of my life. What if this is the Lord trying to teach me something? What if this is something? And then if it, it appears to be nothing, and if God brings you through it, it won't be long until you'll try to look back on it to receive strength from that moment, and the enemy will have stamped across it if. What if they were going to do that anyway? What if it was going to all work out? I, I told that story 
we were talking about that with my dad, what he said about the church way back there many, many years ago. And I told first service that Brother Bob Walrath uh, used to be right here about the second or third row right there. and they, they moved off to the country. He and Alice, we hated to see him go. And uh, once, once Harvey came, he was ready to get out of Dodge and, and uh, he, he told, was telling us where he was moving. I, I meant to look that up so I could tell you where it was, but I don't know if it's, you could Google it and Google would know. Because it's like out, in, like out, way out, way out in the country. He said somewhere between Texas and Louisiana, that means no man's land. And uh, there, there was not a church out there and there was not a store and there were, there, there's not a, uh, there are not people at, out there, not, or not many people. And he was telling Sister Macy about it, and he said, uh, he said, I feel like the Lord wants us to move there. And Sister Macy just said, why would he want you to move there? Well, because he really wanted me to be there. Maybe that's called John the Baptist was in the wilderness. I don't know. But you don't have any people that you can use your ministry with. You don't have any, you know, you don't have any way of, you know, but I, I do know what the real thing was, and I would tell him this if he was here. The real thing was he was tired of paying taxes. Sometimes you got to pay taxes in Texas. We're talking about property taxes and all that. He didn't want any more property taxes. He didn't want to have, he didn't want to have, a, you know, all this traffic in Houston. Well, when you get to Wascom, there's probably not going to be much traffic. I, or wherever that was, I can't even remember the name of the place. I, that, that place came out of my head. But you go to that place, uh, and you're not going to have to worry about traffic because all you're going to have is that one little flashing light at, where the four or five people that live within 100 miles of you, where they all just get together every so often, just sit around and listen to the grass grow. Those, those are things sometimes that maybe that's what it's all about. But one thing Bob Walrath did, all the years he was here at this church, and he voted me in. And every time I prayed by him and listened to him, and if any of y'all ever heard him pray, you would know this. Bob specifically prayed for things. And he would pray about uh, carpenters. God send us carpenters. God send us air conditioned men. God send us uh, guys that can do construction, concrete guys, and, and send us electricians, and, and send us people that, that have job, good jobs where they can make money and be able to help the, the kingdom of God. And if he were here today, I would tell you this God brought every one of those prayers to fruition. Every one of the things he said happened. But he didn't just give us electricians, he gave us people that have electrical companies. He didn't just give us people that, that do construction, he gave us people that were contractors that had their own companies. We're talking about chemical engineers and, and civil engineers and we're architects and CPAs and the list goes on and on and people with great jobs able to help the kingdom of God. But I want to tell you, you can look back on those prayers and say they were answered or you can look back and the enemy can say it probably would have happened anyway. Way. But devil, you're not going to put an if where God puts his approval. It ain't going to happen. Now listen to this. The target is the enemy is saying you are not who he says you are. You don't feel like you are. You don't feel like a child of God. Let me tell you where Jesus was. He was fasting for 40 days. That ought to be enough. But the Bible said he was among the wild beasts. Desert, wild beasts, nothing to eat. How bad can it get? But it was in that moment, the if you are the son of God comes out. Because you look at your condition. You look at the place that you are. And see how easy it is for the enemy to say, if you're a child of God, why are you in this wilderness? Why are you having this issue? Folks, you know, there are times that I see people that live like the pure devil and have money to burn. When I've lived in places where I felt like I wish I could pick up those ashes and put them, put them back together in some way. 
I told the story that we found a tape my mom and dad had of me, a cassette tape that we found last night of me preaching in Kerrville, Texas. And it's one of my first messages. I, I was probably 19 years old, and Brother Danny Frazier was a pastor then. And, and last night we listened to different tapes, and uh, Brandon asked the boys, said, do you all know what a cassette tape is? Surprisingly, they do. Uh, some people don't know what that is. And I had hundreds of cassette tapes, and I wanted to play that tape and some tapes that we had of Brandon and the kids and Brittany when they were smaller. And Brandon asked this question that almost struck fear in my heart. He said, do you have a cassette player? Wow. I may have to go and dig deep for a cassette player. I definitely don't have one in my car. I, I can't just plug it into the car, but I had a cassette player. So we played those tapes, and I, I listened to that tape, and I thought of all the things at, at that revival in Kerrville, Texas, my first revival. I, I thought about being there, living, uh, staying with the pastor. He had four boys, and, and it was in a, a mobile home. He worked a job at a machine shop, and every morning when he got up, I got up with him, and I went to the church because it would have just left me and Sister Frazier there together, and that wouldn't have looked right. And so I, I stayed all day at the church and prayed and read my Bible and, and spent that whole time until he got off work, and, and then I'd go back to the house. I can't tell you all the wonderful things that happened from that and how my ministry moved forward and all the stuff that happened, but when I... When I look back at sitting there in that back room of that little storefront building in Kerrville, Texas, on a five-gallon bucket that had a piece of rubber foam on top of it that he had just placed there, and then two five-gallon buckets with a board in between that was the desk, and that was where the studying took place. And I think about those times, I wouldn't take anything for it. And how God moved in people that received the Holy Ghost. But when I get in a desert place, the enemy likes to look back on where God's brought me from and say, but if you are a child of God, why would your circumstances be like this now? All of you battle that. If you stop for just a minute and think about it. But who God intended you to be, you are that now. You may not be walking in the fullness of it, but the enemy can't take that from you. When it was said over Jesus, this is my beloved son, nothing the devil did could have ever changed that. God said it, and it was forever settled in heaven and in earth. When you go down to the watery grave like Peyton is going to go down in in just a little bit, he takes on the name of Jesus. When you receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues, you didn't just join this church. You are now in the family of God. You're, you're, you, listen to me, the blood of Jesus Christ flows through you. You have the power of the name of Jesus. When you get in a circumstances, you're in the hospital, you're, you're going through some difficult situation, the enemy will come and sit and say, if the baptism was so great, why are you in this condition? You remember Gideon, that man that was hiding out threshing wheat? to keep him away from the Midianites and keep them from getting all of the stuff that he had. You remember what the angel said? Oh, mighty man of valor, the Lord's with you. Here he is threshing weed in secret. And Gideon said this, if God's with me, why am I this way? Tell me you've never had that situation where you're going through something. And people tell you, don't you worry. The Lord's on your side, brother and sister. The Lord's on your side. He's going to come through. And you want to say, if the Lord is on my side, why am I like this? Why is this going on? Why did I get the cancer diagnosis? Why, why do I have to have that surgery? Or why am I going through this with my family if I'm a child of God? He will attack you from places of great victory and place that if over what God said it is done. You will never not be. You may never fulfill what God's called you to be, but it can never be taken off of you. Stand with me. He will hit you, the enemy will hit you at your identity. It's always in a place of sickness, 
discouragement. I'm beaten down. I look around and see other people doing good, and I'm not doing good. I must not be a child of God. I've seen people that live, as I told you a while ago, like the pure devil, and they, they seem like they excel. They do great. Everything's fine. Everything's wonderful. And then if I have an issue, it's like it doesn't seem fair. They have everything. I talked to a couple the other day about wanting a child, and I remember having this conversation with Chad and Angela. And I said, you know what gets you sometimes is when you see people that kill children, which is something that's become a legal thing in our society, or somebody that takes a child, leaves it at the fire station, or wraps it up and throws it in a dumpster, and you think, I would care for a child, and they want to get rid of a child. That's hard to balance. I'm a child of God. That's a drug dealer. That's a, that's a, that's a person that's bound by crack, and, and that's a prostitute in the street, and, and they can have children every nine months. I'm a child of the king, and this is what I get, because the enemy will put an if. If you are a child of the king, why are you getting this treatment? Psalmist said, I went in to church and I found people going in and out of the church. Some of them were not good people, but they were so blessed that their eyes stuck out with fatness. Now that's, that's fat. So fat that your eyes just couldn't stay in the socket. They just like, that steak was just pushing them out. And he said, I saw him coming and going. And my feet almost slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Oh, they're partying down. And I'm praying down. How can it be right? Because the enemy will go there and say, if you are a child of God, why are you in this situation? And I will tell you what he said over and over and over again. Jesus didn't pull up some kind of secret weapon. He used the weapon that is available to everybody in this room. It is written. It is written. It is written. And then the devil got away from him. What you have today is not, oh, a special person is going to pray for me or there's going to be some abracadabra hocus pocus. But what I do have when the enemy comes, I'll tell him what is written. God will never leave me nor forsake me. It is written. I once was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed out begging bread. It is written. All you've got to do is look at what he's done for you and say, I will not doubt. I will not have an if on my miracle. I want our altar team to come and stand with me up here at the front. They're going to sing a song with us today. And I want you to, every service, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to have our altar team come because there are people that's got things that they need God to do. People, you might need the Holy Ghost. You, you just may need somebody to pray for you because you've gone through some discouraging things. You've got a problem in your family. You know. Now look, let me tell you something. When I come up and, and get prayed for it, that doesn't mean, or if you see me kneeling down crying, that doesn't mean that I've done something wrong and I just need the Lord to forgive me. Sometimes I'm praying for some of you that have never gotten up out of your chair. And I say, God, how in the world can I move people? So when people come up and join up with these that are here for prayer, it doesn't mean that they've done something wrong. Sometimes it's two or three are gathered together. The Lord's in the midst of them, or we're going to agree. I'm going to John Dial, and I'm going to say, would you agree with me that I'm going to get that position, or that my family's going to come back together, or my children are going to be saved, or I'm going to be able to have this dark cloud of discouragement lifted off my head. So today when they're singing, we're going to all come. But when you move up here close to the front, if you're in here today and you need, you need prayer, I want you to come up to the front. Now, look, when we get prayer, prayer for the sick, we've already done that. So, so if you've already done that, you, you don't have to come and do that again. It, it's not going to build up. I know sometimes people think that I'm going to come every time because you just never know. This thing, the preponderance of evidence, it may just become enough that finally the Lord said, i got to give up. No. 
But if you need something from the Lord, these are here to pray with you and they know how to pray. Just come and find them. We're going to all come and end around the front. Y'all sing it. Let's come together and let's believe God to do something right now. The